And there it is. <laughs> the five minute countdown. Great. Hello and welcome to what is hopefully and hopefully becomes uh, one or first of the first of many ARM webinar live streams uh, to come. This is going to be an exciting one. Uh, we haven't done this before. Jason and I particularly, um, you know, you might be familiar with some of the other live streams we do here on the YouTube channel, Innovation Coffee. Um, but this is going to be a fun webinar um, and uh, we have a lot of stuff planned for you. My name is Robert Wolf, uh, Senior Developer Evangelist at ARM, and I'm joined by Jason over here, Jason Andrews, who is a Solutions Director and Distinguished Engineer at ARM. The theme for today is frictionless software development for ARM-based clouds. And I'm confident that the content we're bringing to you all today is gonna to be quite impressive. So throughout this webinar, we're gonna learn how to migrate workloads from x86 to ARM-based cloud instances for increased performance, reduced costs, and improved sustainability. Then Jason will dive into a few hands-on review of application dependencies and common migration scenarios before demonstrating three example applications on ARM-based servers. And we were talking in the green room earlier about how this may be a first uh, to show three cloud, uh, cloud uh, uh, demos in a single webinar. So Jason and I have a lot to cover today um, from performance, cost, and sustainability advantages of ARM-based cloud applications, hardware requirement assessments, comparing x86 instances to the ARM equivalents, software requirements assessments, you know, when you're getting everything set up, comparing developer environments and dependencies, application migration scenarios, and then, of course, the three demos, which I'll outline real quick. We have one that is going to be a MongoDB on the Oracle Cloud migration. Another one is Python file compression on Google Cloud. And the third is Docker container examples on AWS. Now, before we dive into this content, of course, as I usually like to do on all of these live streams is a quick little introduction round. I'm also going to introduce myself um, and the things I do at ARM, but we'll start with Jason over here. So Jason, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do at ARM. Yes, I'm Jason Andrews. I'm uh, coming to you from Minneapolis. So I live in the Minneapolis area, a native of Minnesota, which is a little different. And uh, yeah, I work in ARM uh, primarily in the software tools group. So I do a lot of work on our development tools and working with software developers and always eager to promote ARM uh, wherever it is from IoT all the way up to the cloud. So it's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yes. And I am Robert Wolf, Senior Developer Evangelist at ARM. And I deal with pretty much everything that is developer related from building the communities, managing the different assets under the ARM developer or ARM software developer portfolio. So if you see stuff on our ARM developer Twitter, or if you see stuff on our YouTube, or if you participate in our Discord, or if you're um, in line with all of the stuff that we do around certain events, there's, there's lots of stuff that, that I'm working on of course, trying to give a, 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 a hand a hand holding a bit of a hand holding to our developer communities, and of course, um, anything I can I can do to assist, uh, assist in enabling uh, our developers from around the world to build on ARM. So um, I hope that uh, introduction is, is, is suffice uh, enough, and and now we should dive right into the content. So um, just a quick thing here, I was testing this out. Uh, now, when I share my 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 screen for the for this presentation here, which I'm about to do right now. Um, I do go blind, so I can't see the comments in the YouTube channel. So I'm going to actually, I might have my phone out here checking to see if there are any comments coming in. We will have a section at the end of this webinar to go over uh, any questions that you all have. So I will be keeping an eye on the, the questions in the YouTube channel. And uh, if you do have anything, please feel free to post them. Uh, and, and Jason and or myself will get to answering those um, as soon as the webinar is over. So let's get this going now. And I'm going to kick it off. I start off with some, some stuff. And then Jason's going to take it away for the rest of the, the webinar where he has all of the cool technical stuff. So let's get this going. So share screen. Jason, how does that look? Are you able to see? Oh, yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. So as I mentioned, um, this is a webinar on frictionless software development for ARM-based clouds. Um, the, fir uh, the first few slides here um, cover kind of, you know, what is ARM? Uh, you know, where are some resources that you may be able to find to assist you in, in your migration processes? Uh, what are the comparisons and the instances between x86 and ARM and how much you find these? And I'll kind of focus a little bit mostly on AWS in this particular case, because there's just so much to cover for an hour. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about the Works on ARM program, which is a great resource for developers out there to get 
um, access to various cool stuff. Then, as I mentioned before, uh, Jason's going to cover all the cool technical stuff. And I'm actually going to get an opportunity to learn as well here because uh, he, he's uh, done some great work in, in building these demos to show us. So first, first, firstly, let's look at um, the hardware. What is ARM? So ARM is, uh, you know, and if you aren't already aware that ARM is pretty much everywhere, I'm going to say it again, ARM is everywhere. Um, and, uh, and for the most part, I mean, if you are using a mobile device or or a tablet, or even nowadays, uh, consumer laptops, desktops, and what we're talking about today, clouds, servers, ARM is everywhere. We are a global leader in, in, in everything that is tech. Uh, you know, so um, uh, I, again, I don't want to dive too much into this, but you can kind of see some of the, the, the metrics here that kind of allow you to gauge how big ARM really is. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, let's go to the next one here. Um, what can ARM Neoverse do for you? So the ARM Neoverse is our server grade chipsets. And for the most part, I mean, I think this slide sums it up. I <laughs> don't know if I have to read it for you, but uh, ARM can provide you with increased performance, reduced costs, and it can boost sustainability, which is a huge effort uh, that ARM has in, in uh, a global effort for, for sustainability. Uh, Next thing, and uh, and uh, you can find ARM uh, in all of these different clouds. And in fact, I don't think this is all of them, actually. They, you can find ARM in, in various other uh, um, areas as well. These are just kind of the big ones, AWS, Google, Microsoft, and Oracle. Uh, they all have various uh, free tier programs. Um, as far as I know, I am, I'm positive that Oracle and AWS do. I believe Microsoft and Google do as well. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second when we get to the, the, uh, the works on ARM program. But um, this is pretty much where people develop, right? This is the, the, the main developer areas or clouds that, that developers are using. And sure enough, you will find ARM there. Now, let's focus a little bit on AWS. Now, Jason's going to have one demo on AWS. We're also going to talk about uh, Google uh, Google, I believe, and, and what was the other one? It was Oracle. Um, but uh, let's focus a little bit on AWS because usually what I like to say is, you know, when you're when you're talking about migrating a workload, some of the first things you want to do, you're migrating from x86 to, to ARM. Uh, some of the first things you want to do is, of course, assess your hardware. Once you've assessed your hardware, then you want to assess your software dependencies, then you want to assess uh, your workload, right? And so from the get-go, um, looking at AWS, we can look at these five different uh, types of, of their, or their EC2 portfolio, we, we can call it if, if, if you like. Um, and so these are all the different types of instances they have to offer, um, you know, general purpose, of course, being more balanced, compute optimized, being more compute bound, memory optimized, running workloads in the memory, um, accelerated computer, uh, this has hardware accelerators for functions, and then storage optimized, of course, for large data sets. Going a little deeper into this, you can kind of see um, the, the breadth of, uh, of instances that they have and the breadth of availability of ARM-based hardware that they have. So pretty much anything you are building on x86 can be built on an ARM equivalent to boost your, your, your performance, reduce your costs, and uh, increase your sustainability. And I say anything now, um, but Jason is going to cover a little bit more in depth about this as to, you know, some workloads that may need some, you know, figuring out when you're migrating, but for the most part, um, everything that works on x86 works on, works on ARM. And there uh, shouldn't be a reason not to at least consider migrating your workloads over to test this out and see uh, how you can improve your, your, uh, your, your uh, workload performance, optimizing your workload performance. So here you can see Graviton2 instances on AWS have up to a 40% price performance, 4.3.45% performance or times performance per watt and 20% lower cost. If that didn't convince you, the Graviton 3 over here uh, uh, might, might convince you more, but also, I mean, of course, just the fact that you are um, uh, consuming less energy, saving money and boosting your performance, that should be a, a pretty, pretty solid um, uh, reason to, to transition or consider the transitions. Now, Let's dive into some developer resources because I think this is very important. While you are figuring out whether you want to migrate your workloads, whether you're figuring out what workloads you think would be worth migrating, um, you can always go explore the Works on ARM program. 
This program is literally dedicated to developers who want to build, test, and optimize projects for ARM, on ARM. Now, what's really cool about this is that uh, we've basically consolidated and worked with some of the big partners that I mentioned earlier, AWS, Google, Oracle, um, uh, Equinix, and Bare Metal. Um, and we've worked with them to set up this program so that developers can have a free access tier. Now, of course, a lot of these companies did it on their own. But again, we've consolidated some of these and other companies we worked with to, to help them build out this program so that we can provide developers with a subsidized or free um, uh, access to ARM-based servers. Now, this is really nice because, um, you know, as you're figuring out what you want to do, what you want to develop, and, and, you know, whether or not your workloads uh, are, are set up to run on ARM, uh, you can, of course, go experiment and test all this stuff out at no cost to you or your employer. So this is a, a great program. Diving a little deeper in here, and I'll share some links in a moment. And if you're watching this on demand later on YouTube, uh, make sure you check the description because I, we will make sure all of these links, because, you know, these are clickable here. We'll make sure all of these links are in the description below. Of course, I'll share some of these in a moment in the chat once I once I uh, take out take down this, this, this uh, uh, deck. But um, for the most part, you can kind of see here we have AWS, Equinix, Google, Oracle, OSL, Open Source Labs, and then mini nodes. And now I want to just take a look, quick second to talk about mini nodes because this is a, a very interesting uh, addition to the Works on ARM program. While today we're going to be talking about cloud instances and developing in the cloud, um, the edge is also a very important space. And so we've partnered with mini nodes uh, to bring edge based hardware, edge based, edge ARM based hardware. Um, to you as well, completely subsidized, free for you to, to access. This includes um, a plethora of single board computers, edge devices like Raspberry Pi, NVIDIA Jetson Nanos, Xavier's, and the list goes on. So um, uh, again, if you go to worksonarm.com, it'll take you to our site. You can go check this out. You can go read a lot more about all of these different offerings and how you can get access to just a wide variety of developer resources here. Um, to help you throughout your development journey uh, while migrating uh, to ARM. Now, um, why on ARM? Uh, Jason, is this your slide, actually? Sure, I can pick it up from here. Okay, no great. Well, Jason, <laughs> there you go. It's all yours. <laughs> all right, do you want me to share or you want to keep clicking the slides? If, you, if you're if you able to share, that would be great because then I could address the chat if there is anything. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Alrighty, alrighty. Greetings, hybrid robotics. Thanks for joining. Bet you miss bet you miss innovation coffee. All right, let's bring Jason's stream in here. Awesome. Take it away, Jason. You're up. Okay. So yeah, I have just a little bit of a short presentation. We can talk about why I develop on ARM and some of the common scenarios you'll probably work through if uh, you're new to development on ARM. Um, you know, essentially why, of course, the opportunity is expanding. Robert went over the, you know, different types of hardware, scaling all the way from small things up to the cloud, uh, big ecosystem, lots of different options out there. So, yeah, I, I think this probably is one of the first demos we're going to demonstrate a multi-cloud, uh, all our machines. It's pretty exciting. And, yeah, the developer community is really growing. So lots has been happening. Uh, lots of new stuff keeps coming out on ARM. More and more projects are going there. So yeah, it's a great time to, to jump on. So let's go through some of the details. So if you're new uh, to developing on ARM, just kind of a few tips kind of to get started, right? So um, you know, obviously, you've got to get a machine to start with. And I'm going to demonstrate three different uh, cloud providers today. As Robert mentioned, they all have free tiers. Some of them are extremely generous, really great. Uh, and so the first thing you really need to do is get a machine and, and get going. Um, now, once you do that, you probably want to start to think about, you know, the dependencies of your application, do some experiments, you know, get, get a feel for the machine uh, and kind of think about what kind of tools do I need, which programming languages, container tools, performance analysis, um, you know, all this stuff. So, you know, one of the key things some people kind of forget is, you know, this is a different architecture. So you got to keep that in mind. Now, in a lot of cases, it doesn't matter. It'll just be like a Linux machine. It'll be the same as any other machine used in the past. 
But you kind of just got to keep in the back of your mind every once in a while, you're like, oh, that's a binary for the wrong architecture. So you got to keep that in mind and, you know, just uh, pay attention as you're going. And uh, I'll show you some of the scenarios where that comes into play. Okay, so in terms of application dependencies, uh, you know, if you have an application that you're, you want to move to ARM, the first thing you got to think about is, okay, is all the stuff available, right? So we're talking about operating systems, uh, you know, is the same OS uh, and version available on the ARM architecture? Most of the time they are, pretty much all the major Linux uh, distributions are there today. Uh, then you start to think about libraries, frameworks, different runtimes, containers, tools, and you know, your application might sound easy at first, but then you're like, oh yeah, I use that tool and this script and some of the underlying stuff that you use to build applications. So maybe you just want to take a survey, get a feel for, you know, kind of what makes up my whole environment on a particular application. And then what I recommend normally is just start to make a kind of a list or a checklist and do a little homework, right? Do some Googling, look around, see what's out there, see what's available. Um, and typically, there might be a few gotchas that pop up. So when I'm doing application migration, a lot of times I'll come across a container and, you know, I didn't make it myself, came from somewhere else. And a lot of containers have multi-architecture support. They just work. And then all of a sudden you'll spot one. Oh, this one doesn't have the ARM support and I didn't make it. I'm not sure where it came from. So you got to do a little homework uh, on that type of stuff. Um, another thing that I like to do is if I'm not sure, uh, I go around on GitHub, maybe there's a, a project I'm using as a dependency, and I just go in the issues list and I just search for ARM. And a lot of times you'll see, you know, something, you'll either see somebody say, well, yeah, I want ARM support, can you add it? Or they say, you know, I'm requesting this to work on ARM, and then some time goes by in the issue, and then it says, okay, it's all done, it's available now, and the new release. So you can do a little homework there to just kind of find out what's been happening in the projects uh, that you use or depend on. Generally, what I always tell people is newer is better for ARM, right? I mean, uh, the performance will be better, the software will be better. So try to keep you know, to newer versions of software as much as, as possible as you're migrating. Um, you know, one thing we should point out is lots of stuff already works on ARM. So, you know, we're kind of at the point today where you know, a lot of stuff works. I mean, tons of applications are there uh, in, in all sort of domains. So, you know, there's a pretty good chance that, you know, whatever you're doing is probably uh, already available on ARM, but you should definitely um, check that out. Oops, I just bumped the, uh, the sharing there. Okay. Um, I don't see it still. It's not proper. There we go. There, there we go. Now it's back. Thank you. Okay, so check out your, you know, the, the tools you use and the applications and uh, they may work on ARM already. Okay, so let's go into a little bit more of detail now. So uh, when you're migrating applications to ARM, you probably put them in a few different categories, right? So I, I kind of just use three, other people have different number of categories, but you know, there's the easy ones, which is typically gonna be you know, your interpreted languages or JITs where you have Java or PHP or Node.js or Python, you know, those stuff generally just going to work. I mean, it's, it's going to be the same on ARM. You might not even notice any difference. Um, and and you, can, you can migrate those pretty easy. Lots of uh, container-based images are going to be multi-architecture. So if you go to Docker Hub and you pull any of the popular uh, containers, they're all just going to work on ARM, so it's no problem. So in a lot of cases, you can just move your code over and run it, and you might actually have to do absolutely nothing. It'll just start up perfectly fine. Um, the next category then is the more difficult. So this is, uh, if you have things that are compiled, of course, they have to be recompiled for the ARM architecture, right? So you need to get different instruction sets. You need to run the compiler again. So that's your C, C++, Go, or Rust uh, type applications. And there's various ways to recompile or cross-compile your applications. And for the most part, those languages all go through fine. So, you know, it's a little more difficult. You might hit a few hiccups, which I'll cover on a couple of the next slides. But, you know, for the most part, it's, it's a recompile. And then there could be things that are just not possible, right? So if your application is relying on Windows Server, that's not available on ARM. So that's like a no non-starter. No, maybe someday we'll get it and we can have Windows applications as well in the cloud on ARM, uh, but not today. So, 
you know, there could be a case, there's not much, but uh, where it's just kind of like a no-go situation. So, you know, take a quick first pass and see where maybe your application lies. So, you know, this is kind of some of the tips I would have uh, as you go about the migration. So, you know, things like in Python, try to use a newer PIP uh, so you get the latest packages. Uh, Java comes up a lot. So um, Amazon has Coreto as a Java distribution, which is quite good. You know, Java 11 is going to be better than older versions. It's going to run a lot faster because performance optimizations have gone into that. You know, peek around in your Java projects. Make sure you don't have uh, x86 binary objects kind of lurking in there. That happens sometimes. I mentioned containers. We're going to go over that in the demos. Uh, you know, there are multi-architecture containers that will take care of the, uh, the architecture differences completely transparent uh, when you're using those containers. Now, in the compiled applications, you might come across some things like uh, intrinsics uh, in C or C++. Uh, you might want to find those, and I'll go over how to migrate those. You know, uh, languages like Go have new versions, which have big performance increase. So, again, I mean, newer is going to be better because we're kind of in the state where a lot of optimization work is going into libraries and runtimes. Um, so the newer ones you can use is, is usually going to give you better performance. Okay, so I have here just uh, a few different scenarios. These are all kind of real life scenarios that, that have happened uh, to me in the past and those I work with. Uh, but it just gives you a little bit more of a feel for kind of what the state of software development is on ARM. And like I mentioned, we're kind of in a state where, you know, most things work. It's pretty good. Everything is fine. There's a few tweaks and tricks and some gotchas here and there. Uh, so that's kind of what we're talking about here today to help you with those. And then you can gain all those benefits uh, that Robert mentioned. So if you have things like Node.js, uh, you can just move it over and it works perfectly fine. Um, you know, sometimes you get C++ applications that have some uh, intrinsics built in. There are libraries to uh, migrate those. So SSE to Neon or SIMDE are essentially one for one replacements of those functions to take the, uh, the vector instructions over to our Neon instructions and you can rebuild your application and that'll take care of that. Uh, you might hit some underlying library or dependency. So if you have a Python application you know, it might have, uh, in this case, Pandoc is a documentation tool. It has some, think of them like a filter or plugins uh, that come as a binary thing and it's not available. So you might have to go find that library and just rebuild it from source. Um, and when you do that, of course, always tell the maintainers you would like ARM support and lots of them will listen and, and add that in the future. Um, sometimes you might get JDK improvements where you, know, you have an application which works, but it's not taking full advantage of the ARM architecture and instruction set. And there might be uh, something in development which gives that better performance, but it's hidden under a flag. So this is kind of what I mean when you know, the, the performance is coming around. There's still some tricks and a little bit to know. So uh, in JDK, you can enable the use of the crypto extensions, and then suddenly your ARM performance is a lot faster, but it's not yet the default because it's still kind of underway or it's being, being checked. Um, containers, again, sometimes you might come, again, come across dependent containers that you didn't make yourself. So again, you might have to rebuild that yourself or ask the maintainers for ARM support. Um, another thing which comes up sometimes is the uh, Atomics, that's the large system extensions, which is an ARM architecture feature uh, for multi-core, mini-core servers. Uh, that gives a lot better performance. So sometimes C++ applications or libraries aren't built with those atomics. So you might get lower performance and then you can uh, add the LSE and then you'll get a much better performance. So, um, you know, generally this is kind of the type of stuff that you're facing today if you move uh, applications to ARM. Again, they're not major things, uh, but there's little tweaks here and there and it's good to learn some of those tricks. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, move into the demos. So I've got three demos, and I'm just going to maybe highlight them first and give everybody a preview, and then we'll just kind of jump into the terminal and, and run those and uh, see how they go. So they're Jason, kind of, yes. Wh while you do this, I'm going to remove myself from the screen so that I can play around with more of the, uh, the production tools on, on StreamYard. Okay, very good. Give people more, more to view. 
so I tried to bring the demos in, um, you know, different categories. So the first one is kind of the just works category. So this is MongoDB, which I'm going to run on Google Cloud. Uh, and it's Ubuntu 2004. And pretty much you just follow the instructions. I mean, it doesn't really matter that it's an ARM computer. And I'll show you how to run a quick benchmark uh, on MongoDB. And then I've got a link here, which we'll share. Uh, which is to an ARM community blog, which goes through more of the performance analysis details and the price performance advantage of moving MongoDB uh, over to ARM. And then in the next category, we have one which is a Python application that I will run on Oracle Cloud. Uh, it runs right out of the box. It's very small Python script that I'll show you and it works fine, but performance could be better. So this kind of falls into the camp of, you know, if you know a little bit of the tricks, uh, you can increase your performance, uh, and I'll show you how to do that. And, and it's kind of like, yeah, it functions, but can be better uh, if you know how to do it. And that's Python running on Ubuntu 2204. And then the last demo will run in AWS, uh, which will be some Docker container examples. Uh, so this is really just to give people a quick flavor for multi-architecture containers. And I'll demonstrate that both with BuildX, which is a Docker tool to generate the multi-architecture containers. And then I'm also gonna talk about Docker Manifest uh, because that comes up a lot where people have uh, containers they built on two different type of architectures and they wanna link those together in the end and deliver that as a multi-architecture container. So those are the, uh, the demos. So let me just uh, minimize the screens here and we'll jump over to the uh, terminals and get going. Uh, let's make sure, if you wouldn't mind uh, increasing the font size for, for the terminal, please. I think that should be good. Give it a sec there to catch up. Okay. Good. Maybe you can make, are you able to make it a little bigger? Yeah, I can go one more. There we go. That, that should be fine, I think. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So the first demo we're going to do is going to be the uh, MongoDB, uh, and we're going to run this on the uh, Google Cloud. So let me just run NeoFetch there. So you see this is the Google Compute Engine. Again, these uh, instances just came online, the T2A uh, from Google Cloud. So you can have a look at those. Um, and so we can start up here, and we will run the MongoDB. Now, what I've done for the demos is I have... Uh, some different GitHub links, which we'll share uh, in the description. And there's kind of one kind of mini project for each of the demos that you can see. Plus, I've also got kind of an intro to the ARM Cloud instances. So on this page, there's just a small markdown file about each of the cloud providers. Uh, and then they have instructions about, you know, quick start, kind of where to find it, where to see the ARM info, how to get, get uh, an account created and how to get an instance uh, started up. So, you know, if this part is new to you and you haven't used any of these cloud providers, I recommend just click through here, AWS or Oracle or Google Cloud. You can have a look at those and see how to do it. Okay, so the MongoDB is here. I've got all the steps uh, on how to do it. Now, this is an interesting case because you can literally just, you know, go to the MongoDB uh, install instructions, which I'm gonna do. And then we can just have a look at those and basically just run through them, right? It doesn't really make any difference that this is an ARM computer. Let me get back up to the top here. And okay, so uh, I'll just paste these commands through and then you can see how to do it. So I'll just literally do some cut and pasting from GitHub and we'll connect to the MongoDB uh, repository. And then we'll pick Ubuntu 2004 for this one. So I'm going to copy that and paste it again in the terminal. And then I'm going to update the, uh, the package manager with the new repository. Okay. And then we can install it. Okay, so now we're installing MongoDB uh, using the package manager, unpacking the tools and the way it goes. So, you know, it, it's not really any different. You'll see the ARM64 messages go by as it's installing, but there's really no, uh, no different behavior there. Okay, so once it's installed, we can start it up. 
I'll do a system CTL uh, start MongoDB and then just to confirm it's running, let's just do a status command on that one. Okay. So there it is, the service is up and running. We now have MongoDB installed. So, you know, like I say, it didn't really make any difference that it's an ARM machine, but if I do a uname-m, you'll see it's a ARC64 uh, machine there. Okay, so once we have MongoDB installed, let's run a little bit of a performance test. So again, here we're going to install a Java uh, runtime. So I'm back on the uh, GitHub page now. You can copy that command. Jason, real quick, would, would you mind bringing the bottom of the of your of your terminal up a little bit? I can definitely do that. Yeah, there you go. That's perfect. Also, if you could increase the font size on your browser. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Yeah. No problem. Okay, so that's the Java runtime. So let me hit this one a little bigger on the browser. Okay, how's that? Looks good. Okay. So now what we're going to do is run a performance test on MongoDB. So there's a repository here, uh, which is the MongoDB performance test. So I'm just going to copy the commands uh, on how to do that. And we can install it from GitHub. And then here we'll run the, uh, the jar file and make sure that's uh, happy and everything is good. That's well, so that's really just the usage message uh, to make sure it's installed. And now we can launch the, uh, the performance. So you can follow all the instructions in GitHub, but essentially now we're, we're running the performance test, measuring the calls per second and how many uh, database uh, queries we're doing here. And you can see that. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the application that's in the just works category. I mean, I didn't do a single thing different that the fact that this was an ARM uh, server running in, in Google Cloud. Uh, it just looked like normal Ubuntu 20.04, and I followed all the instructions for MongoDB, uh, and away it goes. You can, you can run the benchmark. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, we have a blog at the bottom. It's also on this GitHub page that'll tell you more uh, about those details uh, if you want to read up on it after the webinar is over. Okay, so that's the first demo. So let's, uh, let's move on to the next one. So we will get rid of that machine. Uh, let's bring that back. My sacrifice this morning worked, Jason. So we're one, one demo good. <laughs> one, one is My good. sacrifice okay. to the demo gods. Yeah, All right. good. All right, I'm going to switch now to a blue terminal. Uh, so this is going to be Oracle Cloud. So uh, this is another cloud provider offering ARM instances. Uh, let's do a NeoFetch here and see how what we get. Uh, so you'll see the kernel is Oracle here. Uh, and if I just do LSCPU, you'll see again, it's a Neoverse N1. So all the instances actually today that I'm going to show are uh, based on the Neoverse N1 CPU. Um, so we have another cloud provider. The um, Let's go back to that NeoFetch thing. Yeah, okay, so you see it's ARC64 right here uh, running uh, Ubuntu again. Okay, so if we take a look at this one, we're going to do an, another demo, which is about data compression. Uh, so I have a, a different a little GitHub project here uh, for this particular one. Is the size? Do I need to go bigger? There we go. Let's make it a little bigger. Uh, which is going to be a Python application. Okay, so I've got a few commands here on a fresh instance. You want to install some tools. You'll need to build a library in this case and make sure Python is Python 3. So let's do that to make sure. Okay, that's all set. And then I'm going to clone this repository and show you uh, the Python script that we're going to run. But it's very small. It's just like 10 lines of Python. Um, but essentially what it does is it takes a large file and it's going to run gzip on it. I mean, simplest way to think about it, right? So you can see it opens a file and then writes it out as a, a gzip file. Now, when we do that, uh, we can measure the performance. So I've got some instructions here how to install Linux perf. Uh, which you can do by copying these commands. 
probably already going to be installed on my computer here because I did this before. And then um, I go this one here. So perf is available from the applications. And then what we're going to do is create a large file. So there's a DD command here, which is going to create uh, a large file for us to compress. And we're going to run that. And then it'll create the file. And if I look here, I now have a large file. OK. So now what we're going to do is run that Python script to compress it. So it's just uh, I'm going to run it with perfstat in front of the uh, command. So it's perfstat Python and then give the Python file. And now it's going to use that small script uh, to zip the file. Now, when I did it, the, the perf command will print out the runtime, right? So it's around six seconds, more or less, uh, to compress that file. And when I do it, now I have large file.gz. So I, I compressed the file, took around six seconds. Now, one of the things about uh, this application is it actually could go faster, right? So I put some steps in here. If you want to run perf, uh, you can do that. You can look at the flame graph. You can see where the bottlenecks of perf are. Uh, but essentially, the summary is that the compression part uh, has, has a a method or function called CRC32 in libz. That's your gzipping library in your operating system uh, that gets called when the Python file is run. Uh, and that thing is taking all the time. That's what the performance analysis will tell you. Now, in order to fix that, we can make use of one of the features of the ARM architecture, uh, CRC32, and we can give better performance uh, by doing that. So. If we go back and just do a LSCPU, you'll see in the flags for this particular uh, machine, there's something called CRC32 here, which is available uh, in, in the architecture, and we could make use of that. So you might ask, well, why aren't we making use of that now? Well, that's that's a good question. <laughs> and it's one of those things where you know ARM is there and it works, but it could be better, and I'm sure it will get better, but it's not quite there today. So one of the ways we can check is if we just take the libz from the operating system install, user lib, uh, libz, and if we disassemble that thing and then we look for CRC instructions, you'll see we have zero. So there's no CRC32 um, instructions in that library. Now, one of the common things that you'll pick up if you hang around the ARM software development is there are other versions of the libz or zlib, whatever you want to call it, that are, have been optimized to run faster. And one of the most popular ones is from Cloudflare, uh, and it's in GitHub here. Um, there's other ones that people have optimized for their particular use case, but you can go off and essentially get a new version of this library, and you can use it instead and get faster performance. So that's what I'm going to do here. So I downloaded from GitHub the new uh, libz, and then I'm going to compile it right on this machine. And then I'm going to install it in user local. So I've installed the new, uh, new version of that. Now, if I run that obj dump again, this will disassemble the new library in user local lib. And then it'll tell me if those CRC instructions are, are in there. And when I do it now, sure enough, they, uh, they are in there. And there, there's 10 of them, right? So that means I have a, a library which has uh, CRC instructions. Now. There's another little trick here, which is called LD preload. So what I'm going to do is tell the dynamic linker, when I run my Python script, I want to load my new version of libz.so, not the one that comes with the operating system. And then I'll run the same perf stat uh, to compress the file. And then I will get uh, improved performance. OK, so you see this time, to run the same exact command, it took about two seconds, a little more than two seconds, versus the uh, you know, six, five to six seconds that it took last time. All right, so I didn't really change the application at all. Essentially, what I did is I changed one of the libraries from my operating system out and put in an optimized version. And then I got a much better performance to go from five or six seconds down to two seconds. OK, so big improvement. So that's, that's the kind of thing you might face where, yeah, it worked the first time, but it could be better uh, if you know a couple of tricks to do. And hopefully over time, you know, the, the requirement to learn those tricks will go away uh, as the ARM software ecosystem continues to improve. So that's, that's demo number two. OK, so let's go now to demo number three. I'm going to get some. Uh, white terminals in this case, and then let me make these bigger. 
And then we can look at some of the uh, container activities. Okay. Doing great, by the way, Jason. Everything looks awesome. And okay. congratu congratulations on two successful demos so far. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're on a roll. Let's see if we can pull, roll. Off, pull off number three. This one might be the most complicated, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so in this case, uh, I have another small GitHub project, which is Docker-related things. So why don't I, I think I'll just go ahead and clone this into my uh, terminal to start. And here we're running on AWS. So we have our third uh, cloud provider. Uh, this one is AWS C6G large instance. So this is the Graviton 2, uh, which is available. And if I do LSCPU on this one, you'll see it's quite similar. It's also Neoverse N1, okay? So uh, this is Graviton 2. There's also Graviton 3, which will be the Neoverse V1. If you want to look at that one, you're more than welcome to. Both are available, but this is the, uh, this is the Graviton 2. Okay, so let me just clone the repository there. And what we're going to do here is some different Docker scenarios with a kind of a hello world image. So it just gives you some ideas. Okay, I'm going to migrate to ARM. Um, you know, the best way to do that is to create and use Docker images, which support uh, multiple architectures. And then if you have that, for the most part, it's Docker is Docker. You can just use it how you use it. Uh, but as a developer, you kind of have to make a plan on how to, how to prepare those things. So uh, the application I'm going to use is, again, super simple. Uh, there's just a hello world. This is a C program, and it does a couple of things. It essentially does a uname, so you can see what kind of machine is underneath when you run the image. And then it distinguishes between a 32-bit and a 64-bit uh, user space, uh, because we also have ARM v7 architecture, which is still used a lot in kind of edge devices, and you might want to have containers that support that as well. Okay, so that's going to be the... Uh, the starting point. So I have here a build script, which uses what's called buildx. So buildx is a single set of commands that you can use to build an image for multiple architectures. So you see here, there's a dash, dash platform, and I'm going to build AMD64, ARM64, and the ARM v7, all from a single command. So essentially what's going to happen is it's going to run my Docker file, build a multi-architecture image, uh, just straight away and post that to Docker Hub. And then if anybody goes and pulls that image, uh, Docker will automatically know what kind of a computer they're on. It'll pick the right one of those three, and then it will, it will run that. Okay, so that's, that's how the script works. Uh, the Docker file is quite simple. Uh, it's got two stages. It's based on Alpine. It just copies in the hello world.c uh, program, compiles it, and then it makes another container just move the executable over and set that as the, the default command to run. Okay, so if we run the build, um, you know, this will go through the build X uh, build process. And you'll see there'll be messages saying ARM v7, AMD64, ARM64, and it's kind of processing all three of those architectures at the same time. And then it's gonna go ahead and build the runtime container for that after the, the build is done. And then it's gonna to post to uh, Docker Hub that multi-architecture image. So in certain cases, you can use this type of a flow for your, for your build. Now, the thing about this is, you know, the computer I'm running, in this case, it's the, uh, it's the Graviton 2, it's an ARM architecture, right? So all the things that are just ARM architecture works straight away. It's just gonna run them natively on the machine. Now the other one building the AMD64 uh, image, those, those binaries don't run natively on here, but Docker has built into it uh, emulation so that we can actually run those, those binaries from the different architecture on this computer. Now, depending on your project, that may be fine, and like in this one, or that might be bad <laughs> because your build could be very complex. You could be compiling like a, a large C++ project. That's gonna take a long time. So this is where you kind of have to decide if your project is mostly like moving files around, running installers, this type of workload, uh, BuildX is going to work great. Uh, if you have things that are going to be more compute intensive and be slowed down by the instruction emulation, then you probably want to go to the second part of this demo, which I'll show you next. Okay, so anyway, so we have posted now in Docker Hub the, the Hello World. 
Uh, one of the uh, things you'll notice if I do Docker images, my image is not here. So this was an interesting thing, just came up in the last Docker All Hands. Um, Docker is going to move to container D to help this problem, which is a common developer problem where you, you build an image on your machine, you post it to Docker Hub, it's not actually on your machine. <laughs> so you have to pull it back down. Uh, and that's kind of a thing where, where people get hung up. But uh, I saw in the last Docker all hands that's going to be fixed in the future and we're going to get a, a better build X that continues to improve. So, so that's good news. Okay, so I've posted that. So if I look at the run file, um, you know, I can run any of these images and I can even run the ones for the different architecture on my, on my local machine here and it will uh, do that. So let's just, um, let's just do this and I will run my file. So I have to pull it back down. So I have to put my Docker hub account and put hello world there. Um, whoops, yeah. the wrong paste, hold on. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just use the run script. I'm gonna take these out temporarily. Better to run than having me type. Okay, so there it's pulling from Docker Hub, pull down my image and you see it's ARC64, which is run on this machine. And I can run the other architecture same uh, on the machine, but that, that gives you kind of a flow for the, uh, the build X uh, type of application. Now, what I'm going to do next is something a little bit different where we're going to use a second machine, uh, which has the x86 architecture, right? So that's going to be in the other uh, terminal here, slightly to the right. So if I look at this one, I'm going to do uname. This is an x86 uh, instance. And if you have projects where, you know, the build is compute intensive, you may want to go with this type of approach where you just use a remote builder on another machine. And then we're going to merge those uh, images together at the end. So over on this machine, I can set a uh, Docker context to point at that. So what I'm going to do is put in the IP address, uh, which I can get over here. This is my um, VPC and AWS. If I type I have config, you'll see it's here, 10.0.0.37. And I'm gonna put that right here. So this is going to use Docker to create a remote context. So it says, okay, when I build, don't use this computer that I'm on, go, go use this other machine, uh, which is over here at this other IP address. And then it's gonna do just a regular Docker build and say, please build for the AMD 64 architecture. And it will do that. So if I run remote build, uh, it'll set the context and it'll start running. Now, when you see all these messages, those are actually happening on the other machine, which is kind of neat um, that you can use, you know, a, a remote builder like this and it will run the build. And if I come back on the x86 machine and I do Docker images, you'll see there's, there's my image. So I tagged it as latest dash AMD 64. And if I do even over here, Docker images, I'll see the same thing. You can see the image ID is exactly the same, B01, but it's actually looking at the other machine, <laughs> okay? So can be a little tricky uh, to realize, okay, when you change the context, you, you're essentially working on a remote machine. So it's super cool, uh, but you kind of got to pay attention and make sure you're not uh, spoofing yourself, thinking you're on the current machine when you're not. So when I did that, I posted to Docker Hub uh, the AMD 64 version of that image. So if I go in my hub account here, I'm just going to refresh the browser and make it bigger. And I'm going to look in this uh, hello world. Okay, so the one I just pushed says a minute ago is this one, latest AMD 64. So I got that one there. So now if we come back onto the uh, ARM machine, we can do a build local, I call the script. So I'm gonna set the context back to the default and build on the local machine. And then I will get the, uh, the ARM version of that. So build local, I'll set the context back, run a kind of local build on the Graviton2 and then have that one available. And then I can push that to Docker Hub again. Yeah, just using the script here. And then I'll push the, uh, latest dash ARC 64. Uh, it's an old one. Let's just refresh, make sure we get the latest, latest images there. 
And you'll see there it is a few minutes ago. So now I have essentially two images, right? They're both on Docker Hub. One is for ARC64, one is for AMD64. Now, the benefit was I could build the, uh, each of them on the machine with that architecture so I get the best performance. Now, what I want to do at the end uh, is join those two things together. So this is where the Docker manifest command comes in. So if you run Docker manifest, you can create uh, a new tag. It'll just be called latest, and it will essentially merge those two things together uh, and then put it on Docker Hub. So when somebody goes to pull, they'll just pull latest, and depending on their architecture, they'll get the right one, and then everything will be just perfect. So let's run that join. And then it'll just go to hub and merge those two things together. So let's do a refresh there. And you'll see now we have latest a few seconds ago. So if I click into it, um, you'll see here now it supports both architectures as a single image, hello world with the latest tag. And then now anybody can use that um, you know, and on any machine, it'll just work. So you kind of see the idea was we had two different uh, approaches. We can use BuildX or we can use Docker Manifest to build multi-architecture images. And yeah, it helps in the case where you have these kind of compute intensive things uh, where the you know, use of the emulation can slow down performance. So you can just use this type of a build. So either way. Okay, so that's demo three. Hopefully you got an idea. You saw three different uh, cloud providers. You saw lots of different applications, one that just works, one that works but could run better, and then you saw how to kind of navigate the multi-architecture uh, if you work with containers. Very exciting stuff, Jason, and thank you so much to you and your team for putting together these demos. Um, so um, if you wouldn't mind, let's bring down the share screen here real quick. Okay. Awesome. So um, I want to just kind of summarize here real quick. Uh, Jason, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we went through three demos, one which was the MongoDB on Oracle Cloud. And this is the link here that you can find to go to Jason's uh, code base that he basically pulled all of this stuff from when he was copy pasting all of the commands into, uh, into his terminal. This is what he was working off of. Then there was the second demo, which was uh, on compression, and this was file or Python file compression on the Google Cloud. And then uh, last but not least, uh, the demo number three, which was on containers using Docker container examples on AWS. Yeah. So very cool. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, however, uh, you know, we'll close this out now, Jason. Do you have any other last things you want to say before we close the webinar out? Uh, nope. Thanks for watching and uh, definitely good luck in all your migrations over to ARM and um, yeah, lots of opportunities in the cloud. It's pretty exciting to see so many options for different machines. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined us and everyone watching this webinar on demand. If you'd like to stay in touch with myself and Jason, you can find us on the ARM software developers uh, Arm Software Developers Discord server, which is scrolling across this side, which is scrolling across the bottom of the screen right now. If you enjoyed this video, please smash that like button and follow the Arm Software Developers YouTube channel. We hope to be bringing you more webinars like this in the future. Um, so, you know, you never know, just scrolling across our channel. You might find one that you haven't seen yet on demand or find one that's upcoming so you can set those reminders and watch it live with us here. Um, on another note, I would like to say, this is the, a part of, a, of, a, of another webinar that was also posted. And so if you would like to watch the executive summary um, of uh, ARM-based cloud instances, we will also share that link inside the description, as well as all of the other links that were discussed throughout this entire webinar. So check the description later on. It will probably take about a day or two to get all of those links posted inside the description. But, um, uh, you know, unless they will be there so that you can go access every single thing that was discussed throughout the webinar. Once again, thank you all for spending your time with us today. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. This is Arm Software Developers signing out. Jason, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Robert. And uh, thanks for everybody for watching. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.